I shall play with it. We saw in our last essay that rock music had gone a little bit up its own bum by the end of the 1960s and was, for the most part of it, a dour and all too serious thing, even if it was expanding its boundaries at a great rate of knots. Meanwhile, its constant chart-topping companion from that decade, soul music, was going through some changes itself, but unlike the inherently self-protective rock music scene, soul music was embracing much more radical change. Having evolved from the dance music played by small jazz combos and adopting a much more urban sound, what we can identify as rhythm and blues music first became detectable in the late 1930s and became fully formed in the war years. The first R&B chart in Billboard was published in late 1942, with the first number one ever being Andy Kirk and his 12 Clouds of Joy with the boisterous Take It and Git. R&B found a major sponsor in the late 1940s with the emergence of Atlantic Records, who had established themselves as a major player in and promoter of the black record industry. And it was primarily at Atlantic where an artist they signed in 1952, Ray Charles, began to incorporate both gospel phrasing, vocal inflections, as well as 12-8 rhythms, largely by flat-out rewriting church songs with pop lyrics into his sound around 1954, and later Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller, who had worked briefly with the Tyro Phil Spector, later began to expand on and elaborate on the sound of these Atlantic records, beginning with the Drifters' There Goes My Baby, adding strings, playing rock and roll style riffs and exotic percussion. Ben E. King, who in making his debut on this record, unleashed a vocal with an unrestrained gospel voicing to it. A little before that, Sam Cooke, perhaps the greatest gospel singer ever, married his gospel phrasing and peerless melisma to a pop rock backing and sent soul into the top 40 with You Send Me. James Brown was perhaps the most nakedly derivative of the gospel vocal stylist, and he sold records in staggering quantities in black communities across the late 50s. As the 1960s began, the R&B charts were exploding with a wealth of talent pushing the edges of how the music was instrumentally and vocally expressed, and these sounds were increasingly crossing over to the mainstream top 40. Soul broke out when Bobby Lewis's Tossing and Turning spent seven weeks at number one in July 1960. Ray Charles himself followed up with Hit the Road Jack in October, and then Motown's Marvelous Marvelettes took Please Mr. Postman to the top just before Christmas soul music had arrived. Over the next 10 years, the music ploughed a wide sway through the American and subsequently world's musical consciousness. Between 1960 and 1969, 30 records that I loosely and arbitrarily class as soul music held the number one spot on the Billboard Hot 100. By the time the 70s rolled around, what we called soul music had sprouted so many offshoots through so many dominant personalities that even the offshoots had offshoots. Atlantic still specialised in recording black artists in settings tailored to their sensibilities, from the churchly funk of Aretha Franklin or Betty Wright, jazzier urban poets like Donny Hathaway or Les McCann, more pop-oriented acts like Tyrone Davis or Clarence Carter. Stax in Memphis still had a rich stable of gut-bucket southern soul, Johnny Taylor, the staple singers, Isaac Hayes and many others. Then in Neighbours High Records were just hitting their stride with the slick, groove-laden brand of Al Green, Ann Peebles and Don Bryant. Moving gradually from the burned-out shell of Detroit to sunny Los Angeles, Motown was moving away from its Sound of Young America template that dominated the mid-60s towards a more hard-edged sound with The Temptations, Marvin Gaye and sensational newcomers to Jackson 5 leading the way. In Philadelphia, the writing and production team of Kenny Gamble and Leon Huff had been spending the last two years honing the style that was to become known as TSOP, the Sound of Philadelphia, that was to dominate airwaves from 1971 to 75. And, of course, the hardest working man in show business, James Brown, when he wasn't saving major cities from being burned down, was nearing the peak of a five-year journey into what he called the heavy, heavy funk, and he'd attracted a swathe of disciples. Sly and the Family Stone, fresh off 1969's number one hit, Everyday People, were heading off into strange new directions, and George Clinton was gearing up with this twin dose of funky strum and drang with funkadelic self-titled debut and sister band Parliament's Osmium in February and October 1970, respectively. And down where it all began in New Orleans, a whole new generation of distinctive locals were making their mark. The Meters, Lee Dorsey and a slew of acts in Alain Toussaint's production stable were producing a lean, sinewy funk, which eschewed solos for pursuing fat, monstrous grooves. The scene was bursting with talent, innovators, a huge fan base and labels that backed it to the hilt. Yet in five years, it was in ruin. How did that all go down? 1970 saw Curtis Mayfield's solo breakout with his self-titled album. 
Songs like If There's a Hell Below, We Are the People Who Are Darker Than Blue and Move On Up show a sharp social consciousness which may feel bought with him from his great songs in The Impressions, predating Stevie Wonder and Marvin Gaye's world wearier efforts by almost a year. Curtis laid down some much copied production templates for the new decade, towering strings over hyperkinetic bass lines with busy percussion, which came to resound right into the disco era. 1972 brought about his most famous work, the soundtrack to the movie Superfly, a song cycle similar in intent to Marvin Gaye's What's Going On, but without any of Marvin's hippy-dippy Jesus Loves You sentiment. Compare his Save the Children with Mayfield's Little Child Running Wild. Marvin can't let go of hope for the children. Mayfield knows there isn't any. Superfly is rightly regarded as not only one of the classics of soul music, but it regularly features on lists of the greatest albums ever made. One of the artists most closely and fondly associated with black consciousness in the 1970s was, like Mayfield, another Chicago native, Gil Scott Heron, particularly with his two albums, 1971's Pieces of a Man, recorded with Miles Davis's bassist Ron Carter, and 1974's Winter in America. Underpinned by incessant jazz funk, these records, particularly The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, The Title Track and Prisoner from Pieces, and Rivers of My Father and the Bottle from Winter, are unadornedly poetic, focused, propulsive statements of how Heron saw life north of 110th Street, and how north of 110th Street saw life in the wider world. Like Mayfield, who focused more on the personal, Scott Heron saw hope and hopelessness in equal measure. Unlike Gay's pie-in-the-sky pipe dreams or Sly Stone's willful oblivion on the almost nihilistic there's a riot going on. Of the socially conscious black singer-songwriters of the early 70s, Swamp Dog was the most cynical and probably the funniest. His 1970 masterpiece, Total Destruction to Your Mind, which fused stacks, style, soul, and wild rock sounds in a crazed melange of LSD, sleazy sex, Protest songs, dirty politics, and Zapparesque satire went even further in the notion of a soul rock crossover than Sly Stone had ever dared. Long regarded a cult classic, it and the two following albums, including Rat On with its famously dodgy cover and Cuffed, Collared, and Tagged, established him as both an incredibly wry eyed onlooker to the world and, with his version of John Prine's Sam Stone on Cuffed, one of the great soul vocalists of his age. It was another kid from Chicago, Donny Hathaway, who brought a certain innocence with his socially and spiritually conscious songs to the table on his debut Everything Is Everything in mid-1970. Hathaway used his multi-tracked vocals to create a hypnotic bed for his songs, an idea that Marvin Gaye would appropriate wholesale for what's going on, and he used this on some clever covers, some of which he partially rewrote, and message songs like The Ghetto and Trying Times. 1973's extension of a man furthered his rep, this time with the aid of more self pen songs, but apart from a duet album with Roberta Flack, that was all we got from Hathaway in his short lifetime. Diagnosed with schizophrenia as early as 1971, he went off his medications in late 1978, and after abandoning a record session in January 1979, he went home and threw himself off the balcony of his apartment building. As Marvin Gaye asked what's going on, Sly Stone answered him, there's a riot going on. The Family Stone was on top of the world as the decade turned. He'd enjoyed a number one hit with Everyday People in 1969 and his greatest hits album had reached number two. But underneath the shiny exterior, Sly's world was slipping into darkness. The band had lapsed into heavy drug use and Sly was tarrying with the Black Panthers, who insisted he sack his white band members Gregor Rico and Jerry Martini, along with his manager. Bassist Larry Graham was distressed by the gangsters Sly was suddenly hanging out with and the two fell out over it. The 1970 single, Thank You For Letting Me Be Myself Again, hit number one in February, but even that contained a dark undertone. Thank You ending on the menacing note, Dying Young is hard to take, selling out is harder. By 1971, with Sly largely incapacitated due to his drugged out state, the band was in parlous shape. They decided to record an album as best they could at the record plant in Sausalito, but Sly was too incoherent, paranoid, or bent on destroying the group and himself to keep things together, so eventually he retreated to his attic surrounded himself with an arsenal of gear and an even larger arsenal of chemicals. The album oozes despair and weariness, it groans and creaks, and in the opener, love and hate dissolves and collapses as disassociated voices you can barely hear hover over a mix made so muddy by sly bouncing tracks down so many times. It's the sound of hope Marvin held out turning irredeemably sour, of everything good and promising sinking into a murky narcotic haze. It's a powerfully fascinating record, so willfully perverse, cynical and sceptical, you can't help but try and dig into it. It spent the last two weeks of 1971 at number one on the US album charts, and a single family affair, a sort of updated everyday people, also hit the top. The follow-up, Fresh, was more of the same, sort of, a little more cynical in tone and somewhat more accessible in sound. By this time, Larry Graham and Gregorico had both left the band, breaking up one of the greatest rhythm sections ever. 
Even the poppy single, If You Want Me To Stay, is so riven with anger that it fits right in. Aretha Franklin had established herself as, along with James Brown, the greatest star in soul music, and already wore her crown as Queen of Soul with an eternally indisputable assurance. But she too fell afoul of changing styles, despite some stellar work. Her first album of the decade, This Girl's In Love With You, was a case in point. As she had in the 60s, she usually followed up a mid-record with a stonker, and her next effort, Spirit In The Dark, followed by The Scorching Live At Fenimore West and Young Gifted In Black in 1972, is a hat-trick of fantastic albums. She followed this in mid-1972 with the biggest-selling gospel album ever, Amazing Grace. Aretha was hot, but how did it all come undone? 1973's Hey Now Hey was a sloppy, undisciplined and schizophrenic effort, half purporting to be an album of jazz standards before Atlantic stuck in their oar and demanded some more contemporary material. It was her first Atlantic album not to make the top 25 subsequent albums, while all containing moments that captured her breathtaking voice exquisitely, just didn't have anything that captured the imagination. They still sound a little tired even today until her contract ran out at Atlantic in 1979 with the disco farce of La Diva. It was a happy ending of sorts, because Aretha did make a comeback in the mid-80s on Arista, including her biggest-selling record, Who Zoom and Who. Roberta Flack was a remarkable vocalist, in a lot of ways Franklin's counterpart. Franklin was a pure gospel belter, and Flack, while she was raised singing in a gospel choir, was more of a classicist and widely eclectic. She had directed a production of Aida while still a teenager. She debuted in 1969, and a song from that album called The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face made number one almost three years later after Clint Eastwood featured it in Play Misty for Me. Across the 70s, Flack was an amazingly consistent performer. Her thoughtful, deeply intimate vocals and impeccable song choice saw her release only one album, the contractual obligation Roberta Flack, which missed the top 40, with First Take making number one in 1972, and she had three number one singles, Killing Me Softly, The First Time Ever, and Feel Like Making Love. Not the bad company song, although she could have pulled that off. 1971 brought some bright new talent, songwriter Bill Withers, whose warm, relatable songs Brian Wilson considers him the songwriter-songwriter, and sumptuous baritone earned him a number one single with Lean On Me, a string of critically acclaimed and commercially successful albums, and most importantly, and almost uniquely, he got to walk away from the business on his own terms. Speaking of his induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2015, he said, Well, I suppose I haven't done too badly for a guy from Slab Fork, West Virginia. The man they call the last great soul singer, Al Green, broke through in 1971 with his Al Green Gets Next To You album and the singles, The Tough I Can't Get Next To You and The Sweet Tired Of Being Alone. Early 1972 bought his masterpiece, Let's Stay Together, the title track being a number one pop hit, although his output right through to 1975's Al Green Is Love is outstandingly consistent, and his 1975 Greatest Hits album has to be one of the most played of all albums in my collection. Green's career, while it didn't end, was stopped in tragic circumstances. In 1974, he was sued by a former employee who claimed Green assaulted her and pushed her through a plate glass door in a dispute over unpaid wages, Green later settling for $100,000. Then, his girlfriend, while recovering from a previous suicide attempt, dumped a pot of boiling grits on him while he was in the bathtub, burning him severely. As James Brown would say, she then shot herself with a thirty-eight. Green was also kidnapped by a cousin who claimed he owed him money shortly after he was released from hospital. All this convinced Green that it was time to get right with God, and after he completed his contract with High Records, he went into Bible college in 1976 and founded his own church in 1977. Green's problems continued, though, as he allegedly treated his new wife appallingly, beating her severely and was charged with other assaults on two separate occasions. Horrible person notwithstanding, he remained simply one of the most masterful soul singers who ever lived. Anne Peebles hissed and purred her self-penned hits down on high records with two great albums, 1972's Straight From The Heart and 1974's I Can't Stand The Rain. And the Isley Brothers, liberated from Motown, got on the funky train and sold millions of albums across the decade with 3 Plus 3, Go For Your Guns and The Heat Is On, the latter making number one on the pop charts. The other brightest newcomers were one of the few bands that survived the disco revolution, Earth, Wind and Fire. Led by the slightly eccentric visionary Morris White, EWF were really a band of three halves and perhaps this explains their longevity. Initially a Sly Stone influence to funk soul combo, they built a steady following with a series of five albums from their later much sampled debut in 1971 to their 1975 movie soundtrack That's the Way of the World, where they adapted a more expansive sound and this was their commercial breakthrough. 
Given their slick funk pedigree and readily adaptive nature of White as a leader, they were well positioned to remain popular through the disco era, which they did with the albums Spirit, All in All and I Am all making the top three. They also racked up seven top ten singles including a number one with Shining Star. Post-disco, they had three more top ten albums before White put the band on hiatus in 1983. While EWF were there at the birth of the slicker funk soul sound, the Philly sound developed by writers and producers such as Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff and Tom Bell with its smooth kinetic rhythms, hyper busy bass and lush orchestrations was a huge commercial force in the early 70s and very directly paved the way for the disco breakout in 75. Beginning in 1972 with the OJs who had a string of great hits like Love Train, Backstabbers and For the Love of Money, the slick soul sound lent itself to great records by the Spinners, Lou Rawls, the Delphonics, the brilliant Blue Notes with Teddy Pendergrass and the post-Motown Jacksons. In fact, Michael's Thriller is probably the most enduring tribute to the Philly sound. More on Philly in a later episode though. Right about here, ladies and gentlemen. I want you to get yourself and your soul together. This man will make your liver quiver, if you will, let's all welcome the world's godfather of soul, soul brother number one, James Brown! James Brown dominated black music in the 1960s as not only its most prolific hitmaker, but as the driving force in breaking soul music away from its two and four rhythmic structures to a more syncopated on the one beat and changing the role of a singer to effectively being part of the rhythm section. He'd begun this at the start of the 60s, but totally committed to the change after 1967's earth-shaking cold sweat. Brown began the decade with three monumental funk slammers, Sex Machine in July, Super Bad in October, and Get Up, Get Out and Get Involved in November. 1971 saw Brown leave his longtime label, King, for Polydor, departing with March's soul power and announcing himself to his new Germanic overlords with Hot Pants and Make It Funky. 1972 saw what was probably the peak of his powers, a magnificent talking loud and saying nothing, King Heroin, There It Is, and Get On The Good Foot. 1973 saw the first chink in his armour. Brown's world was turned upside down when his son Teddy was killed in a car wreck. Brown's focus shifted as his personal problems mounted and only Ants in My Pants hit the top 40. He rebounded in 1974 by sheer force of will. The payback, My Fang, Papa Don't Take No Mess and Funky President. While they performed well and are as idiosyncratic and authoritative as ever, Brown came undone quickly, as Disco gathered pace his audience of the urban black kids who'd followed him because he reflected their world, joined the me generation and sought the collective coma of the dance floor. Music moving from the live experience that Brown had tailored his band and performance towards, to one where the focus was on the crowd. Brown was no longer aware who his music was made for. Get Up Off of That Thing was a brief respite in 1976, but by 1979's original disco man, Brown was a parody of himself. I got it. Watch me. By now you'll have noticed a theme developing at pretty much the end of each of these little vignettes. A common thread to every story that some cataclysmic event wiped the great 70s soul artists from the face of the planet in almost one fell swoop. The Disco Apocalypse. While we will deal with disco in its own instalment, the slicker style of the Philly sound, which appealed extensively to white audiences, crossed with the extended instrumental vamping that James Brown's bands developed, which removed the necessity for the vocalist to be the centre of the song's focus, suddenly rendered a whole generation of artists redundant. Some, Marvin Gaye, Aretha and James Brown, managed limited comebacks. But for the rest, it was the end of an era. 